Good morning. We welcome uh, to our hearing on reform and major weapon systems acquisition related proposals the distinguished panel before us. We have people of rare experience, technical expertise, Ruth Leon, Senior Vice President for National Security at the Center for American Progress, former Deputy Secretary of Defense, most important, former Staff Director of this committee. And we welcome him back. Dr. David Chu, an old friend, President of the Institute for Defense Analysis, former Under Secretary of Defense for Personnel and Readiness, and former Director of Program Analysis and Evaluation in Another Life. Am I right? He appears today in a personal capacity. David Berto, Director of Defense Industrial Initiatives Group at the Center for Strategic and International Studies, also a former Department of Defense official. Paul Francis, Managing Director for Acquisitions and Source Management and a 32-year employee of the GAO, Government Accountability Office, and we welcome you. It's worth noting that at least Three of our witnesses participated actively in the debates surrounding Goldwater Nichols. That's a page out of yesteryear, but it was a very important uh, page. And Mr. Francis, you may have also participated in those debates. And I'm sure you'll let us know if that is so. Since the recommendations of the Packard Commission led directly to the acquisition reforms in Goldwater Nichols, it would be interesting if each of you at some point they would share your perspective on how to best apply the philosophy of the Packard Commission to today's problems. Committed Armed Services is under consideration two serious proposals to reform the acquisition of major weapon systems, not the entire, but the major systems. The HR 2101 was introduced this Monday by myself, and John you, along with Rob Andrews and Mike Conway, who led our panel on defense acquisition reform. A number of other members uh, co-sponsored it. H.R. 1830 was introduced March 31st as the companion measure to the Levin McCain bill in the Senate, sponsored by Ellen Tauscher and John Spratt, both of whom have also joined us as co-sponsors of our bill, 2101. Both bills focus on the acquisition of major weapons systems which represents about 20% of the uh, annual defense spending and purposes, purchases. Now, let there be no mistake, the committee and special the panel are just as focused on the other 80% of the uh, defense acquisition as on this, but this is a step in the right direction. 2101 introduces three significant new concepts. Number one, we require the Secretary of Defense to designate an official as the department's principal expert on performance assessment. This official will provide the department and Congress with unbiased assessments on just how successful our acquisition programs are or are not. Number two, we require certain programs to enter into a sort of intensive care for sick programs, programs that are not meeting the standards for system development or that have had critical non-McCurdy breaches, uh, they'll get the additional scrutiny necessary. Number three, we require the department to set up a system to track the cost growth and schedule changes that happen prior to milestone B. That is milestone B is the decision point where we begin development of a production system. It's before milestone B that some 75% of the program's costs are actually determined on the whole, there's a lot of commonality between the two bills. About 25% of uh, is the same, 50% overlaps, and about 25% is in the House bill only. I'm confident our committee and the Senate Armed Services Committee can find common ground in, in compromise legislation as we have been in, in the past. And I look forward to the recommendations of our witnesses on how to improve these bills as they mo move through the legislative process. This is a major milestone. You know, when we were working on what turned out to be Goldwater Nichols, uh, we really didn't feel the great impact, though we dreamed it and guessed it. We didn't really feel the impact that it was going to have. It changed the entire culture uh, of the American military, and this 
to me just as sweeping and just as important. And I want to give a special thanks uh, to the panel, to Rob Andrews, to Mike Conway, and all those that, that are on the panel uh, that have helped come up with this legislation. But, but I must tell them, your work, your work ain't, ain't done yet, but this is the first step. John McHugh. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Let me, let me start by uh, echoing your words of appreciation to uh, our two colleagues, uh, uh, Rob Andrews and, and uh, Mike Conaway, who have done a stellar job in leading uh, their able members. And uh, frankly, what I think is something we all should take a great deal of pride in. We're, we're deeply in their debt. But as you noted, Mr. Chairman, uh, we have uh, a ways to go, and particularly with the uh, final touches on this piece of legislation, I want to add my words of, of welcome as well to our distinguished panelists. I noted to our former uh, two secretaries, Messrs. Uh, DeLeon and, and Chu, uh, this is kind of like a personnel subcommittee reunion only because we're on a different topic. They let us come into the big house here. We're usually in 2212, but it's good to see uh, them back as well and always appreciate their input. And we look forward to today's discussion. Uh, last Friday, Mr. Chairman, I was pleased to join with you and uh, Mr. Conway and Mr. Andrews and uh, helping to announce this legislation. And as you noted too, this. Uh, very important bill officially adds our committee voice to the conversation about reforming the Pentagon system for acquiring weapons. And it's true, it's taken us a bit longer than our Senate colleagues in drafting the measure, but I think we could all agree uh, we wanted to ensure that we had the benefit of feedback from industry, the department, and members of the Defense Acquisition Reform Panel. And I would certainly argue the resulting bill addresses the most substantive concerns uh, we have heard in that regard, uh, but there's always room for enhancement. And that's why, of course, we've asked our uh, panelists to join us today and help us uh, to perfect what I believe very strongly is always a, already a very good piece of legislation. And as drafted, the uh, bill properly reforms and increases focus on the early stages of the system requiring the evaluation of alternative solutions at more critical points and independent oversight earlier in the process. A focus uh, on early stage acquisition is vital, as has been stated, and then we know from experience the sins which cause cost overruns are very often created in the initial stages of the acquisition process. Uh, Mr. Chairman, this bill, as you know, very well makes both organizational and policy changes, and rather than uh, cite them by rote, I would simply uh, refer to my uh, written statement that, it, with your permission, the unanimous consent, I'll have entered in the record in its entirety. Without objection. And simply say beyond that, uh, we make use of the existing panel on contracting integrity, which was established a few years ago by this very committee urging it to make recommendations to minimize organizational conflicts of in interest, especially for contractors who provide acquisition support to the department and who also may compete for future technical work. And as well, uh, the legislation directs the Controller General to review the mechanisms DOD uses for considering trade-offs between cost, schedule, and performance, and thereafter make recommendations for improvement in that area. Despite the list of reforms, and they are several, our bill is really relatively narrow in scope. Acquisition er workforce issues and acquisition of services have been addressed in prior year's bills and will continue to be considered by our uh, colleagues on the uh, acquisition reform panel, which will carry on with its work, as the chairman noted, and uh, fulfill its mandate to consider initiatives that uh, might well be addressed by the committee as part of the 2011 National Defense Authorization Act. The only area related to the workforce is the provision which would authorize the award of cash prizes to DOD personnel for excellence in acquisition. I know there are many, including the outgoing Under Secretary of Defense for Acquisition, Technology, and Logistics, who have suggested that 
Additional legislation in this area is not warranted. John Young recently told reporters, and I'll quote, I just do not think you can mandate a process that will ensure successful defense acquisition. The bottom line, he went on, is people run programs, not documents or processes, end quote. Secretary also <laughs> noted and compared acquisition reform to mandating there'll be no more crime. Uh, that I have to say I find that particular analogy somewhat alarming, but I do, I agree with him. In the end, implementation of sound acquisition policies and maintaining a skilled workforce is probably more important than passing new reforms. Nevertheless, we continue to see poor outcomes that might well have been avoided had there been a stronger independent voice earlier in the program when the warfighters had a clearer role in establishing the requirements up front, and that is in large measure what this legislation attempts to do. And indeed, both the Senate Bill S-454 and our House Bill seek to meet these objectives, and I encourage both members here today and our witnesses to be really open with their questions and concerns. This is the time to make sure we get this important legislation right. And we look forward to working, as we have in the past, with industry, the department, our Senate colleagues to enact meaningful reform within the Department of Defense. And with that, Mr. Chairman, I would uh, yield back the balance of my time. Chair, thanks to the gentleman from New York. And the chair now recognizes with uh, uh, the former chief of staff for the House Armed Services Committee staff, former Secretary of Defense, retired physician Rudy DeLeon. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee for this chance to testify and comment this morning on the Skelton McHugh bill and be part of this, this dialogue. Congressman Skelton did mention Goldwater Nichols. That was passed almost 26 years ago. It did create a revolution in the military culture, making the United States military preeminent in terms of operational planning, command and control. It was a huge change, largely to correct at the time the problems in the planning for the Desert One rescue of the hostages in Iran, 1980, and then the peacekeeping deployment in 1983 to Lebanon. Goldwater Nichols created a revolution, and I think since then, on so many fronts, intelligence, homeland security, now in terms of trying to get the State Department and the U.S. Agency for International Development to become more operational, one of the ingredients of Goldwater Nichols was, was the vigorous participation of both the House and Senate Armed Services Committees in the lead up to the debate, working with the then Reagan White House, and then in the oversight of implementation. Uh, it was a very vigorous process, and so I think that the chairman and the ranking member have, have started that process on, on acquisition, as have their counterparts in the Senate Armed Services Committee. Um, no need for me to replicate what's in the written statement, and if I can just have it be part of the record, thank you. Um, one of the things I think our panel will, will have consensus on is that we do need to focus on regenerating the expertise in the career civilian federal workforce in both contracting and in engineering. It's a core competency that the government needs to have. It's, it's, it's not a significantly large number of people. It is more the cadre of key people that are fully versed first on the contracting side. We saw that in Iraq where operation and maintenance contracting is so critical, we did not have the depth of people that could deploy with our military forces to go and do the logistics support and the, and the contracting. In many cases, we pressed some of our uh, talented people in the Corps of Engineers who had really spent their careers on the uh, federal waterway side to deploy to Baghdad, but you know, they, they had gone from managing tens of millions of dollars of contracts per year to um, several billion dollars worth of contracts per month in, in a military environment. So one, we've got to put tremendous emphasis on the career personnel that are masters of standing up for the public interest on the contracting side. That's one. Two, we need to invigorate the engineering side of the federal workforce as well in, in, the, in the contracting process um, because engineering is what has made U.S. equipment 
uh, for our military forces so capable. Um, the engineering is, you know, is, 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 is analytical and it produces solutions. And so we've, we've moved away as our federal workforce has gotten smaller, we've lost some of the, the core competencies. The, I, the illustration I use is the heroic effort surrounding Apollo 13, where, it, where, where, where the folks in the back room who, com who created a, a, a return um, uh, mission plan for the, the astronauts, those were all government workers in their 30s and early 40s who, who did that work. They were all engineers. They were all leading edge. We're not saying replicate that capability today, but we need a cadre of, of capable engineers, particularly on the IT side, who can really advise the government, write requirements, and then make sure those, those requirements are, are filled. Um, in terms of the uh, measures of your, your bill that's before us today, um, the performing assessment is very important, looking at cost and schedule. It will also be important to factor in some of the unintended things that increase cost and schedule. One is when the government side changes requirements and keeps adding to requirements. The poster for that program right now is the presidential helicopter, but we could go through a variety of programs where after the program is initiated, someone on the government side has said it needs to have more capability. So then everything has to be re-baselined. Capable engineering on the government side can help minimize that and force the trade-offs. Um, equally, the budget process, uh, when dollars get, get tight, um, programs will shift to the right in terms of doing the kinds of uh, independent cost assessment that the program analysis and evaluation sector of OSD does. Uh, with programs shifting to the right, you're adding cost, you're, you're, you're adding years to the program. So it's, it's important that we be able to factor all of these things because they're all critical to, to the process. Finally, just uh, in terms of one Goldwater-Nichols issue to have uh, revisited here, and I think your bill references the need to bring in uh, the component commanders uh, into the system on, on requirements. Um, Goldwater Nichols created something called the Joint Requirements, the Joint Requirements Oversight Committee, JROC, um, and it was to be comprised of the vice chiefs of each of the services. And so the service chiefs, the joint chiefs, are responsible for organized training and equipping, but they really don't have a legal role in the requirements process. So I think you've noted in your bill the need to get the military advice on the requirements process. I think that uh, at some point we'll want to further discuss the role of the chiefs because I think the chiefs feel that this is a legal requirement that they don't currently have but something that is operationally important to them. So the role of the chiefs in the requirement process I think is an important issue. I think your bill mentions that and you make a, a first start. And um, with that, I will certainly uh, put my time back, but I certainly welcome this chance to be back to the committee. Chair, th Chair thanks the uh, <coughs> former secretary. And the chair now recognizes Dr. David Chu, former undersecretary of defense for personnel and readiness. Five minutes, sir. Mr. Chairman, Congressman McHugh, it's a great privilege to appear again before uh, this committee this morning. I do have a written statement that I hope may be accepted for the record. I should emphasize I am testifying today based on my- Without objection. Thank you, sir. I'm testifying today based on my prior defense experience, not uh, in any way associated with my current uh, employer. Uh, this does not necessarily represent its perspective on these same issues. Uh, I had the privilege of uh, starting in the Department of Defense in 1981 at the time when the then Deputy Secretary, Frank Carlucci, focused in his uh, set of management initiatives on improving the estimation of costs for major weapon systems. And he took as his instrument uh, a notion advanced originally by David Packard when he was Deputy Secretary uh, some years before uh, that independent cost estimates ought to be seriously considered during the formulation of department's plans. Independent because the proponents of a system obviously have an interest uh, in the cost outcome that may uh, affect their judgment regarding the realism of the numbers that are brought 
uh, brought forward. Uh, Carlucci's decision, in my estimation, signaled that the role of independent cost estimates uh, would be more than just uh, playing an advisory function in the acquisition process itself, that it would be central to how he, as Deputy Secretary of Defense, managed the programs of the department, made so-called programming decisions, uh, and how he, as Deputy Secretary, would formulate his budget recommendations uh, to the Secretary and on to the President and their embodiment in the President's budget request. That management emphasis in that period uh, was focused uh, in annually the review of two significant overlapping issues that I think are uh, important in the objectives the, the committee has set forward to achieve with the proposed legislation. First, that systems should be budgeted to their most likely cost, and second, that systems ought to be procured at efficient production rates. And in each year during uh, the 1980s under Secretary Carlucci, then Secretary Thayer, and Secretary William Howard Taft IV, uh, those two issues were an important management review at the conclusion of the programming phase of the planning, programming, budgeting uh, system. I think it was very, very important uh, in ensuring that the costs that came forward were closer to the likely level that uh, the department was going to confront when actual execution uh, took place. Everyone agrees in the wisdom of having independent cost estimates. The challenge always, of course, is how you're going to pay for the additional resources that they might entail, the offset, so to speak. The department in its budget planning, as you appreciate, just as the Congress does here, operates within a fixed top line. So if Program A needs to enjoy more resources to ensure it can be executed correctly, uh, programs B, C, D, E, or F are necessarily going to suffer or perhaps uh, face uh, elimination from the Department's proposals. And that is, in my judgment, where the tension arise, arises when the difficulty uh, starts uh, to uh, uh, move the Department away from what might otherwise be best practices. In that environment, uh, what can be done? Uh, first, I should note I agree with Congressman Hughes' point that in the end, there's really no substitute for good people, good discipline, and good sense in managing the processes of uh, the Department. I do think Congress has been uh, careful over the years to leave the actual organization of the Secretary's office to his or eventually her discretion, uh, and I do think that principle is embodied in the House, uh, in the House uh, bill. Uh, I believe five things might be considered. First, uh, to resurrect what was required in the 1980s, uh, and that is a report to the Congress uh, on the utilization of independent cost estimates, how the issues they raised are indeed confronted in the budget a request that I believe is part of the House bill as it, uh, as it is drafted. Second, I think attention needs to be paid to the staffing of the cost estimation function within the department. It's a subset of what uh, Secretary DeLeon raised in his, uh, in his uh, comments, uh, staffing both at the service level and at the level of the Office of Secretary of Defense. Third, I would urge, and this is in, I think some contrast to the Senate bill, I'd urge that the cost function be kept as part of the larger analytic enterprise of the department, not separated out. Unity of effort in this domain improves the quality of the estimates and ensures that there is the both cost fertilization and professional challenge that the estimators ought to face. If you look at how two large advisory organizations and budgetary matters are organized in our in our government, the Congressional Budget Office and the Office of Management Budget, they both embody the cost, they both embrace the cost estimating function as part of their responsibility. And I would keep it that way in my judgment within the Department of Defense. Fourth, uh, some years ago, the Committee on National Statistics, a, a branch of the uh, National Academy of Sciences, recommended the department that it create, in essence, a federated database uh, of the performance data of all systems from birth to death, from the early developmental testing days to operational tests to actual fielding. Uh, I do think that would be an important adjunct to the performance uh, emphasis that the House bill, uh, House bill uh, advances. And finally, most important, this comes back uh, to Secretary Carlucci's decision in 1981, to the spirit, I think, of the House bill. I think it's critical to send a signal that these independent cost estimates are important and that they'll be paid attention to in deliberations of the Department uh, and of the Congress. 
I thank you, Mr. Chairman. Chair, thanks to gentlemen. The chair now recognizes Mr. David Bertu, Director of the Defense Industrial Initiatives Group, Center for Strategic and International Studies. Five minutes, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. It's quite a privilege to uh, appear before you this morning. The last time I was before this committee, the subject was base closures, and I assure you this is a much happier topic um, to, uh, to be here today. Um, I do have a written statement with considerable background and a number of both general and specific comments, and I'd love for it to be inserted Without in the objection. record. I'll make a few points orally and, uh, and then uh, yield back the rest of my time. Uh, I should point out that although my day job is at the Center for Strategic and International Studies, and I do draw in my statement on a number of our research uh, and reports, uh, my comments here this morning don't necessarily reflect the views of either my boss or my employment, so, uh, uh, or any other organization with which I might be affiliated. The lawyers make me say that uh, uh, so that it protects somebody, probably not me. Um, I think it's important to note that there are four very powerful dynamics that are at work today as you undertake your efforts to reform uh, defense weapons acquisition, and I'd like to note those a as a starting point here. One is that the political climate that we operate under with regard to defense contracting is about as poisonous as I've seen in, in 30 years here, and it's actually difficult to have a rational discussion because of that poisonous political environment. Um, it wasn't even this bad in the mid-1980s when we had the Mel Paisley uh, uh, jailing and the spare parts horror stories, et cetera. So I think it's, uh, it takes a certain amount of courage and balance, and I applaud this committee for tackling that. Uh, the second, though, really offsets that because defense today has an unprecedented level of dependence on contractors. And, uh, and I think that we all recognize that. We all recognize that we're not going to dramatically change that. The amount of money and time it will take is, is long and much. Um, but I think it's also important to note that it, that dependence is largely under-recognized, especially by the combat arms parts of the military. And so there's an amount of education that has to go on as well. The third, and the chairman, both the chairman and Mr. McHugh noted this in their introductory comments, there is a substantial agreement that it's time to do something about all of this. And, and that's a very powerful element uh, or dynamic that comes into play uh, because I think it gives us the opportunity, uh, even despite the, the poisonous political environment, to, uh, to tackle these. And the fourth is a complicating factor of, uh, of the, the money's not going to be quite as abundant uh, over the next five years as it has been in the past five years, which will make it a little bit more difficult. Um, and I, I think you all are at the center of all four of those dynamics, and it's useful for you to keep them in mind as you go along. In my statement, I go into a number of the things that we see as key elements for reform. You do address a number of them in your bill. I also spend some time on trying to answer the question of why is it that acquisition reform has not worked as well as it would like to. I've been privileged uh, over the last 30 years to have been involved in a great number of these efforts, uh, all the way back to the Carlucci initiatives uh, where Dr. Chu and I um, uh, shared a number of hours together. Um, and down through the Packard Commission, et cetera. And it leads me to ask the question that I think is useful for this committee to ask. If these are such good ideas, because the same ideas keep getting repeated over and over again in every study, why is it so hard to do them? And, uh, and I attempt to come up with some of the pitfalls that I think have befallen previous efforts, and, and uh, they are in my statement, and I look forward to continuing to uh, work with the committee and the staff as you move forward here. Uh, finally, Mr. Chairman, I, I think it's useful to note that I don't think there is any ability to do acquisition reform without a change in the way we do requirements. Um, there's a tendency today for requirements to become locked in almost as a sacred text, and the only change that can be made is to add to them and to make them more demanding and more difficult. Um, I think that Secretary Gates has laid out a path which is actually quite constructive. It's one that says, Maybe we ought to look at the 75% solution. We can get it quicker. We can get it cheaper. It might be good enough. And I would uh, commend you to that and also to the President's uh, statement in his March 4th Memorandum on Government Contracting where he uh, basically says we need to do a better job of, uh, of doing contracting, have more competition, create more fixed price contracts in order to control costs. Now, there's a lot of pitfalls in that process. But at its core, it can only be done if we do a better job of defining requirements and then using those requirements as an element of the trade-offs that have to be made with cost and schedule. 
not only inside the department but actually in contract negotiations so that you can achieve a performable program at the kind of schedule and money that you have in the budget and and i think that you make some steps in that direction in the bill i have a number of comments on other provisions the final point i would leave you with mr chairman really goes back to the goldwater nichols and the packard commission and i did have the privilege of serving on the packard commission staff and working particularly with my colleague mr de leon to the right in his role with this committee at that time one of the things that the the goldwater nichols bill is widely recognized now to have not paid much attention to is actually the role of the office of the secretary of defense in the pentagon it dramatically strengthened the joint staff it dramatically changed the relationship of the military departments but it didn't really address o s d some of what your bill does does tackle that question i urge you to keep that in mind i think the most fundamental principle that david packard had in mind was that it is important to let the secretary of defense manage and organize the department as he needs to in order to achieve his objectives and i think that's a principle that requires a strong o s d and i think that you should be well to keep that in mind as well as you move towards final passage of your bill with that mr chairman i'll conclude my remarks and i look forward to your questions thank you chair thanks to gentlemen and we now recognize mr paul francis managing director for acquisitions and sourcing management United States Government Accountability Office for five minutes, sir. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, Mr. McHugh, members of the committee. I appreciate your uh, inviting me here to participate in the discussion of acquisition reform today. Uh, let me start off just by saying that the need for reform is not debatable. I think by any measure, the cost growth and schedule delays that we see in weapon systems are excessive. These have a number of consequences, but uh, I think of two right off uh, the top of my head, and one is uh, buying power. The money we set aside for individual programs, in some cases, buys less than half of what we thought that it was going to buy. And that then, uh, the other thing I think about is opportunity cost. What could have that money have done if we're able to use it elsewhere, either on other programs, somewhere else in the department, or even somewhere else in the federal budget? We've tried uh, adding more money. I think in the past 10 years, the amount that we put in uh, the investment accounts, research and development and, and procurement, has doubled, yet the outcomes have not gotten better. So I don't think more money is necessarily the answer. So you ask yourself uh, the question, what does need to change? And um, one of the consistent findings that GAO has had over the past 10 years is DOD needs to have a knowledge-based acquisition process. And while there's been some improvement in that area, the portfolio of weapons today largely are not knowledge-based. And I think a main reason for that is the requirements process, the funding process, and the acquisition process do not foster a knowledge-based uh, approach to acquisition. In fact, in some cases, they work against it. Um, for example, the requirements process today still is service centric, still has a preference for high performance, and I think in Secretary Gates's terminology, uh, exquisite requirements. In the, uh, the funding process, I think still creates an unhealthy uh, environment for competition. Programs have to compete for funds, and there's pressures on program sponsors to keep program estimates artificially low. When you finally do get into the acquisition process, now you start off and it's overpressured. The requirements are very high, the cost estimates are very low, and the process at milestone B typically begins before the programs know enough to really get a sound basis for cost, schedule, and performance. Once they get started, they become schedule-oriented, and they will go through their engineering gates, if you will, like design reviews, also with insufficient information. The consequences of, of these problems, uh, the cost growth and schedule delay, are assuaged through cost plus contracts, reductions in quantities, delays, and do-overs. So cumulatively, when you look at all three processes, they're not very good at saying no when no should be said. They are very good at saying yes. And that's why it took, I think, the extraordinary efforts of Secretary Gates to come in and say no at a time when it was really hard to do so. So these processes have to do a better job of that. 
So then uh, I'd like to think about the reform measures that are proposed in that context. And I think, you know, simply about the model of let's do the right thing the right way. And the thing in this case being an acquisition. So along those lines, I think about reform in three areas. One is how do we get to a good program start? And I, I'm thinking there about the pre-acquisition uh, processes, particularly requirements and funding. And I really think that the, uh, the proposals to strengthen cost estimating and systems engineering will go a long way to identifying the trade-offs that need to be made in the requirements and funding processes and help then to make them, because that's where they need to be made. When a requirement comes out of the requirement process, it needs to be technically reasonable and financially reasonable, and they aren't today. Uh, the second area of reform I like to think about is uh, what, does it, what does it mean to have a good start on a program? And there I think about the, uh, some of the metrics that are in Title II, uh, the, the reforms that have to deal with strengthening technology maturity, uh, the design review process, test and evaluation, and competitive prototyping. I think those need to be turned into metrics. This is the lens that, uh, particularly for oversight, you need to look at a program at milestone B to see if it does, in fact, measure up. And uh, I think the third area of reform, at least in my mind, is following through on execution. And uh, I think there, and I'm thinking there of the performance assessment function. And uh, to me, that means providing the enablers, the resources to execute properly, and that's people, authority, and incentives and awards. It's also metrics to see uh, when programs get out of line, and it's also then the consequences, establishing consequences for programs that do get out of line. And I think those three really are important to follow through on execution. And I'll just wrap up with the, uh, uh, the one thought, and I think uh, uh, I'd like the point that Dave Berteau made, uh, uh, that rhetorical question about why haven't these things worked. In my mind, uh, th th there can be a tendency, particularly for a person like me, to look at these processes as broken, and we're going to go in and fix them. But because they've generated the same types of outcomes for decades, I think we have to look at these processes as being in equilibrium. They, they generate these results over and over again. And to try to get something that's in equilibrium to behave differently, I think is a greater challenge for reform than going in and fixing something. And the last point I'll make is uh, the people. I think the people in the program offices and in the staff offices in the Pentagon, really, in my experience, are, are fabulous. And so from a reform standpoint, you have to say, why aren't good people getting better outcomes? And I think that's part of our challenge as well. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I'd be glad to answer any questions. Uh, thank you very, very much. Uh, let me ask one question, if I may. And Mr. Leon, we'll start with you. The House bill that, that we've introduced focuses the majority of it uh, on, uh, number one, on the early stages of programs development uh, when the major decisions that will shape the program are made. And the second on programs that have demonstrated problems by violating the maturity or are not meeting uh, intense criteria for milestone B. Are we correct? in focusing on the early program stages and on the so-called sick programs that violate their maturity or uh, otherwise in, in trouble? I think what your assumptions are at the beginning of a program live with that program throughout its life. So if you have a particular rate of aircraft or ships how you baseline the program lives with it from a requirement point of view, from a calendar point of view, and then from a cost, cost point of view. So you've got to really begin with, with programs in their very earliest stages. Understand what the requirement is, why you need to buy it, and then lay that out and look at how you're going to execute. And where the independent cost analysis becomes important is that in the internals of both the – and remember – 
you've got an acquisition process and a budget process <coughs> that intersect at critical times and that at other times are completely separate from each other. So you can live in a world of logical assumptions on, on rate and numbers in the acquisition decision, but then the budget is going to be compressed by O&M requirements, by other, other areas. So the, the baseline becomes very important. Now, when those programs start to breach Nunn McCurdy, it'll be important, why are they breaching? Um, were the original baseline numbers incorrect, overly optimistic? Um, have there been requirement changes? Are budgets being, being, being stretched? But once a program goes against those baseline breaches, it needs a lot of critical attention. Otherwise, as our GAO witness just said, the culture will just absorb those, those, those changes. So I think appropriately that front end is the requirement right, are the assumptions on cost and schedule legitimate assumptions to make that are likely to drive the whole program. That's the critical phase and that's where the independent cost estimating comes in. There are many budget battles where the secretary and the deputy and the chairman and the vice chairman have to adjudicate. Are we going to use service numbers? Or as Dr. Chu and I know, th there was an exceptional cost analyst in the program evaluation system for, for years. I'm gonna, his name was Dave Nicholson. He was the embodiment of what a public servant would be. And we'd be in these budget sessions and Dr. Chu at one point in his career, myself at another, he would be pressing the services on some of the assumptions in their programs. And uh, sometimes it would be 10 against three. It's, a, it's, it, it, it's not a, a good ratio in those meetings, but the thing about uh, Mr. McNichol as a public servant was he was always well prepared. His numbers were always rooted in fact. And these were among the most important deliberations. Are we gonna put the optimistic estimates into the budget? or are we going to put the independent CAG assessments in, into the budget? And these could delay program decisions by months in some, some cases, but the secretary and the deputy traditionally, the PA&E was, was their budgeting function. So your independent analysis becomes, becomes critical. And then the culture of the secretary, the defense resources board, uh, the chairman and the vice chairman who, who use these same resources knowing why these independent numbers are different, but at the end of the day, those independent numbers, the history shows, are, are usually more correct than some of the early service assumptions, and that's do a critical milestone. Do you, do you milestone. think we adequately address that in our House bill? I think if you are able to attract the capable people who will become dedicated public servants like Mr. McNichol, then you have addressed that correctly, yes. Dr. Chu. Mr. Chairman, I think you're right to emphasize uh, what you call sick programs that might more neutrally term them outliers. I mean, you look at the cost history, which is what I focused on this morning, cost history programs, there tends to be a reasonably good sized group that performs well, but then there are a number that perform extremely badly. And so I think the emphasis that you give to what I'd call the outliers as the focus man's attention is the right one. Why did they go wrong? What's wrong? Did we ignore the independent cost estimate, et cetera? Second, uh, regarding the issue of emphasis early stage, I could not agree more. And in that regard, I'd like to underscore the emphasis that both Mr. Berto and Mr. Francis gave to the setting of the so-called requirements theory. Indeed, I plead that we move away from that term in our vocabulary. The problem with saying something is a, quote, requirement it means there's no compromise possible when it turns out that technology or cost or schedule make it very difficult to get to that objective. Indeed, I do believe the department continues to suffer from what in the Cold War might have been a defensible outlook, but in present circumstances is perhaps much less, much less justifiable as Secretary Gates has underscored in his comments, aiming very high on the technology performance front, so high that's very difficult to see when you start the program from the engineering or scientific perspective, how are we really going to get there? And I think you pay a price both in cost and schedule and ultimately in performance because it turns out that's not achievable. And so I think a more nuanced view and a more uh, 
uh, energetic willingness to think about trade-offs in performance to meet the broader capability goals would go a long way. And I would urge, as part of the vocabulary change, that the system think about backing away from the word requirements, except in those cases where it really is a requirement, that the system must operate with some other system in the software sense, for example, or that uh, the cargo must fit inside the box of the airplane. That, yes, those are requirements. But beyond that, many of these statements are really technological objectives, not perhaps requirements. And if we chase them, we pay, as you all know, often a very large price in terms of what is required in <coughs> resources to get the last 5 or 10 percent of performance. Maybe that's not worth getting. And we often pay a huge schedule price in their achievement. Mr. Chairman, your focus at the front end is critical, and I just really have one comment uh, to reinforce that. Uh, before DOD has spent 10 percent of the money on a program, more than 70 percent of the total cost of that program has been determined. And so that's why you need to pay attention at the front end. Mr. Francis? Uh, Mr. Chairman, I'm uh, in, in total agreement uh, with focusing on the, the front end and the requirements process. Uh, I would add a couple of things. One is um, we have to make sure from a resource standpoint, if we want better analysis done up front, then we have to make sure we have the organizations, the people, and the analytical tools in the department to do a better job. And then the second thing is, uh, what you do with money decisions are, is really going to reinforce what you do in reform. So if you set out really good standards for programs to meet, then the programs that meet those standards are the ones that should win money. And those that don't measure up will, will have to lose in the money competition. And I think that'll be really important to making your reform stick. Thank you so much, Mr. McHugh. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Um, I'm going to go back to a point that was just uh, explored by Dr. Chu and also uh, Mr. Bertel made comments to it in his, his opening remarks. And, and when, I, when I spoke uh, at the beginning, I, I talked about uh, the, the ability to trade cost, schedule, and uh, warfighting utility. And, and Dr. Chu, I apologize. I, I agree with your comments about requirements, but until we get a new word for it, I'm going to use the word. <laughs> you know, requirements, as we all recognize, based on the chairman's previous question, are established pretty much in the, in the front end of the acquisition process. But those key performance parameters uh, are articulated in terms of desired performance minimally accepted performance, that, and I don't see any prioritization amongst requirements, but probably equally important, any kind of dollar schedule or schedule goals to those requirements. And you can have five key performance parameters, but it, it's certainly in most instances in clear, unclear which is most important and which could be eliminated if unaffordable or which are, or if something is needed sooner. Uh, from the warfighter's perspective, there's an opportunity cost of systems, weapon systems, cost growth, uh, because as, as I believe as uh, Mr. Berteau mentioned, as that evolves, it makes other programs be, uh, to become unaffordable. So I, I wanted to run it through the grist mill again and give the other panelists a chance. How, how can we make the acquisition process more responsive to, to the warfighter needs in terms of identifying those capabilities, uh, when they're needed and at what price and how to, how to buy it off at 75 percent. I mean, do you have any thoughts as to how we could formalize that into, a, into an actual structure? Anybody? Well, we I think, Mr. McHugh, we're back to budget trade-offs as well as programmatic trade-offs. But I would acknowledge it took the drive from Congress to get the MRAP program going, and that was hugely a game changer once those, those new vehicles were, were integrated. So um, being, as your bill says, talks about bringing in the, the, the inputs from the operational side, I think becomes 
becomes more and more important and understanding what you're willing to trade off now the problem is is that in our current acquisition you're making decisions on systems that you won't see in the field for eight to ten years and so the urgency of of a trade off is really lost as contrasted to expeditiously needing to get a ground vehicle into iraq that was survivable for our troops where you created some 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 carve outs so the timing issue here and we're back to mr skelton's question dealing frankly with with what it is you're buying up front and what the assumptions are the military utility that becomes very critical is there a way and let me just add a, a component to it beyond the, the formality of, of changing that system and in, in, in the regard you just mentioned uh, Mr. Secretary uh, is just emphasizing the importance of reviewing that and making those decisions repeatedly along the time frame. Can that actually change the culture of, to get us to make those sometimes hard decisions? The presidential helicopter obviously is a primary example of nobody doing anything of the sort. Uh, it just kept being added on, added on, added on. And then ultimately, frankly, the, the manufacturer gets blamed on it, on, on the contractor. I'm not so sure that was a a fair assessment of blame across the board there. Dr. Chu, do you want to? Congressman Hero, I think uh, uh, the, the door that you open the House bill to invite the uh, combatant commanders to have more of a voice in this process is helpful. Uh, because in my experience, that's always the voice of reality. They are the here and now. They have actual war plans they must be prepared to execute. Uh, and getting their advice. I do think you're right that insisting that there be periodic reviews of whether the, forgive us all, the requirements as stated are still valid uh, is uh, helpful. I do think there are two kind, two different kinds of requirements problems. One is what you signaled uh, happened in the Cold War uh, with, uh, with missile uh, 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 programs often where people would keep adding new features they thought were needed. And so deployment was delayed, costs rose, sometimes appropriately, I would uh, argue, as those requirements are added. Uh, different problem is they're set unrealistically high and there's no give, there's no debate, there's no mechanism for backing off. And I do think in, this, in both problems, more attention to the effects we want to have with the system or the outcome we want to achieve and less on the engineering parameters per se would be meritorious. Going back to the basic cost operational effectiveness analysis or analysis of alternatives and ask, okay, what we were trying to do here was X and let's look at how well this system is doing and do we really have to have this last margin? Do we get close enough with what is being achieved as opposed to what might require additional resources to to realize. Mr. McHugh, I think I could add three things to that. Number one, I, I agree with, Ms. with Dr. Chu about the word requirements. It has probably 20 different meanings, um, but I also agree we won't expunge it from our vocabulary. I prefer to use the phrase real requirements, which has no as yet joint staff approved definition and therefore um, we can define it to mean those things that really matter here. Um, and I'll illustrate. Uh, the Air Force tanker, which of course is a subject that many in this room have spent a lot of time looking at. There are, I believe, some 35 uh, unnegotiable requirements built into the tanker uh, solicitation and 800 negotiable requirements. I would respectfully submit, sir, that when you have 800 of anything, um, it cannot be a requirement. That's just too much to trade off. I think there are three things that, that, that you can do. Uh, one of them, you do make a step in that direction by consulting with the combatant commanders as part of this process, and I think you could strengthen that role. Um, the second is I really do believe there needs to be a strong role for the Office of the Secretary of Defense there. The original proposal by the Packard Commission co-chaired the uh, Joint Requirements, what was then the Joint Requirements Management Board, later the Joint Requirements Oversight Council. That was to be co-chaired by the Vice Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff and the Under Secretary of Defense for Acquisition. The Joint Staff has carefully maneuvered over time to make sure that uh, participation by OSD is at their discretion, not at the Secretary's. 
um, and I think that's something that could be looked at. The third is actually to make cost a requirement. Uh, because ultimately, if we can't pay for it, it doesn't matter what else is in the list there. And, uh, and I think that's an important element to bring into consideration. Thank you. Uh, Mr. McHugh, I, I would add uh, the requirements process, I really think, needs a lot more analytical rigor. There, and uh, we have to have, I think, particularly with the joint staff, uh, more ability to challenge requirements. I think uh, Mr. Taylor will... will uh, remember quite vividly how a, a couple of years ago the Navy made a very impassioned case for the DDG-1000 here and it had to be approved exactly as they had laid it out and then two years later they testified that they didn't need it. That just tells me there's, there's room and requirements to, to challenge. We need the analytical rigor and we, we need data and that's where I think we do need technical information I think we need a, a group sort of like what Dr. Chu led in PA&E program analysis and evaluation to be involved in that process and ask those questions. And I think we have to think about acquisition maybe saying we need time certain development. Let's put a limit that we're not going to engage in an acquisition that will take more than X years. Pick a, pick a number, five or six years. If you can't develop and field a solution in that amount of time, then those requirements aren't actionable. I think we need to bring that kind of rigor up to the front. Thank you all very much. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I'll yield back. Thank you very much. Uh, moving right along with the five-minute rule, Mr. Taylor. Thank you, gentlemen. Let me, uh, let me pose a a very timely question to you. I don't think there's a single person in the United States Navy who can tell me what LCS number one ought to cost or LCS number two ought to cost. And thirdly, I don't think there's a single person in the United States Navy who knows what an electromagnetic launch should look like. I can look behind me. We have expertise, uh, people on this staff who have flown fighters. We have people on this staff who have been captains of submarines. They have a pretty good idea what the next fighter should look like, what the next generation of submarines should look like. But when you're dealing with something like the electromagnetic launch where we haven't done it before, uh, where should we be looking for the expertise to make sure that this is done in a timely manner and that we don't end up in the year 2015 with a nuclear-powered helicopter carrier that should have been an aircraft carrier? Drew, do you want to start? And one of the things unique about the U.S. system is the fact that on the engineering side, we are always pushing technology, coming up with new ways of thinking about things and new ways to use technology. That's partly what has made our equipment so, so unique. We get in these technology pushes, and we sometimes get into the optimistic assumptions, thi things like that. Um, if we look back historically on the acquisition system, there was a set of tools created across acquisition. They were called the Federally Funded Research and Development Centers. The Institute for Defense Analysis, used often by the committee, RAND, MITRE, um, the aerospace uh, effort out in California. These are federally funded, nonprofit, largely engineering um, operations that can serve both as complements to government procurement managers, but also on the critical engineering side as a real reality check. The Center for Naval Analysis is another, another group in, in this category. So as we look for both technical expertise and at the same time not wanting to rely on the contractors for the technical expertise, we have these other, other tools that are available. Now, as with our acquisition but, but, but to those specific points, Mr. DeLeon, where should we be looking for some expertise? So I think if you've got technical issues, you've got to get technical expertise. So the FFRDC is one place. Yeah. Um, MIT, uh, some of our leading, Georgia Tech, some of our leading engineering schools. But the independence in, this, in the system can come from the government side, but we also have, you know, again, a technology base in the country that's very unique and extremely capable. How would you, so you, you feel you feel comfortable that we can prevent an LCS type problem, a Coast Guard 20, 123 type problem, 
going, going to the electromagnetic launch, you think they have the expertise to see to it that, that we don't repeat that mistake when we go to hit on the Ford carrier? If you bring in the potential technology troubleshooters that are out there, that are not going to be in the contractor, probably not going to be in that service program office, so you, le le you reach out to some of your, your leading focal points of, of engineering. You might ask the GAO to go and, and talk with some of our, our leading uh, universities on the engineering side to, to test some of these technologies. But what you're really doing is back to Dave Berto's 10%, you are forcing the tough question to be asked in that initial phase. And it we can't take uh, just on, ba on faith that some of these advanced technologies will work. We've got to bring in the troubleshooters who will ask and help the Congress, the Office of Secretary of Defense, the services themselves to focus on the tough engineering technical questions that are there. The debate will be very helpful. Uh, thank you. In, in the minute that I have left, would anyone else like to? Mr. Taylor, I, I spent a year on the Defense Science Board task force that looked at the LCS and the presidential helicopter. And, uh, and I, I would say I looked at the 29,000 pages of naval vessel rules that were imposed on the LCS contractors after the contract had been signed. I say I looked at them in the sense that when the two carts with the 29,000 pages were wheeled into the room, I observed them. Um, I would say to you that, that in a, at one level you're right. We, it, precisely saying what it's going to cost is very difficult. But it was quite clear looking from the perspective that we had that what we did know it was not going to cost $220 million in two years. And everybody except one person in the Navy knew that and largely agreed with that. Um, and so I think one of the questions that you have, and your bill actually addresses this, is how do you make sure you don't let that sort of thing happen? We could ignore the reality of what we know something's not going to be. There's another element, though, that comes into play because what you've got is an emphasis in the bill as well on technological maturity before making critical decisions. And it's absolutely uh, key that these two things go hand in hand. Until you've got better development of your technology and greater maturity, you can't do a proper cost estimate. And so I think those two elements of the bill have got to stay hand in hand here as you put them. Thank you. Thank the gentleman, Mr. Bartlett. Thank you. Until you uh, know what the problem is, it's hard to draft a solution to the problem, and I'm not sure I know what the problem is here, and I wonder in the few moments we have if you would help me to try to understand that better. There are several uh, reasons for increase in uh, cost growth. One is inflation. These are big programs that take a long time, and the dollar deflates, and uh, the other is uh, commodity price increases in excess of, uh, of, of inflation. Let's take those off the table because we understand them, and I think that for the usual program, they're fairly small. I've categorized the reasons for, uh, for increased cost under three categories. Let's imagine for the moment that they represent the totality of the reasons for increase in cost. One is requirements creep. We just keep changing the goalpost. The second is uh, intentional underbidding. Uh, I worked for IBM for eight years, and we were at a competitive disadvantage because our bosses wouldn't let us lie. Uh, our competitors would underbid knowing that they could more than make it up on engineering change proposals, and I couldn't do that when I worked for IBM. I have no idea how much of this goes on in these major platform uh, acquisitions. And the third one, I hardly know what to call this. If I'm charitable, I guess I'll call it being overly optimistic. More realistically, you might call it incompetence, not understanding the complexity of the, of the challenge. If you would do me a favor and write these three things down on a piece of paper, requirements creep, the intentional underbidding, and the third one, call it whatever you want, incompetence over optimism. And then if you put a number by each of those and make those numbers add up to 100%, the extent to which they contribute to, uh, uh, to, to cost growth. Again, the requirements creep, intentional underbidding, and the third one, uh, overly optimistic or incompetent, whatever you want to call that category. And when you have those numbers down, if you could just uh, uh, give me those numbers, it would be very helpful to me in understanding. I'm not sure I understand this problem, and you are four experts, and I'd like your assessment of what these are. <laughs> Uh, Mr. DeLeon, do you have those, those numbers down? 
got them in front of me. And okay, what do you have for requirements, Creed? I, I would say that that's probably 50% of the problem. 50%, okay, and underbidding? Um, I'd say that's the most easily corrected by the independent cost tools your bill seeks to initiate, so you can do that with vigorous independent analysis, so you could conceivably r reduce that, but so we can make that zero if we... Uh, I'd be happy okay, to But what do you think it is now, has been? I think it's probably 25%. 25%, which would mean that incompetence is 25%. Well, you use that term optimism, so... Optimism, okay, so I optimism, would use, fine. I would okay. use that, because I think a technologist is going to always, you know, if, we, if we back go to our original comment, which is let engineering drive the system, then engineers, you know, can solve those 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 problems if you focus on them as engineering problems rather than as budget problems. So at least half the problems are ours. The the um, uh, requirements growth. I think that drives programs. Okay. And that Dr. last. Chu, what are your numbers here? Uh, so I put uh, more uh, weight than my good friend Mr. Leon on the last category, excessive optimism, uh, which I think is typically. And this is a case-by-case case issue, so it's very dangerous to generalize. I understand. I, I, but I know in general, I think that's on the order of half the problem. Okay. Often associated with schedule, because we think we're going to achieve something much faster than the reality. And of course, if it takes longer, you carry all that overhead burden on for additional years. Uh, and then I would put second, uh, requirements issues. It's not just creep. Because in some cases, yes, it is additional requirements, but in others, we've aimed far too ambitiously relative to what science and engineering can actually produce. And On the underbidding, I, I would emphasize it's not always purposive. A statistician who had nothing to do with defense procurement came to me one day and said, you know, you ought to think hard about decision rules that say you would give the contract always to the lowest bidder. That may be the one player who least understands exactly what is required to produce the article. So it's not necessarily purposive. It's a bias in terms of the perceptions of those who are. R roughly what, 30, 20, 40? Oh, I, I, my, again, I, speaking off the top of my head, I would, I think the underbidding problem or the misbidding problem is, is the smallest part of the problem, maybe 20% or less of the total. Okay, good, okay. We have a few moments left, and uh, like the numbers from uh, Bertha, what are your numbers? Mr. Bartlett, I, I actually can only get to 100 if I add a fourth category. What would that be? Uh, and that is the disruptions of the budget on, on programs, and particularly okay. the last minute Well, let's imagine for the moment that that doesn't and, happen. And I, I would also echo uh, uh, Dr. Chu. One of the hardest memos for a procuring contracting officer to write is the memo that says, I went with the more expensive program for the following reasons. Um, but I will tell you, sir, I can't put a number on those four categories without much more thought than I'm able to put into it in, in this five minutes here. I will get you my, uh, my detailed analysis of that uh, down the road. Thank you, sir. Uh, Mr. Bartlett, I, I split them evenly. Uh, I consider the requirements, not only requirements creep, but un unreasonable requirements. I think like Dr. Chu said, I think that was the case on electromagnetic uh, launch. Underbidding is not, not only contractors, it's inside the Pentagon. We've got information that shows even when you do have an approved baseline that we don't put those numbers in the future year's defense program. We put a lower number. So we underbid inside the Pentagon. And optimism, I think, extends not only to the cost estimates but the entire schedule. And I think any program, you can get derailed at the start, you can get derailed in the middle, or you can get derailed at the end. Well, thank you all very much. Thank the gentleman, the uh, chairman of the Acquisition Reform Panel, Mr. Andrews. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you and Mr. McHugh uh, and my, my partner in this, Mike Conway, for the, the teamwork that we've had here. It's, it's a pleasure serving with three such distinguished gentlemen. And I'd like to thank the panel and some members of the audience as well for contributions you've already made to the panel's work. It's been invaluable, and this morning was just an extension of that. Um, I've learned uh, a couple things in the, in the time we've been looking at this. The first is that when we look at the $296 billion figure on the March 30th report from the GAO, that most people jump immediately to the wrong conclusion, which is that that's a measure of poor manufacturing and oversight in the manufacturing process. To some extent it is, and I very much enjoyed Mr. Bartlett's way of trying to score those. I thought that was very intriguing. I hope everybody 
maybe supplements their answers for the record. Uh, what I've learned, though, is that very often it's driven by poor baseline definition, which we spent quite a bit of time talking about today. And to further peel this back, uh, the poor baseline definition, I think, very often is driven by an irrational and inaccurate requirements process. And that's, I think all witnesses have been very good about that today. So it's interesting to hear the consensus um, that our bill's focus on pre-milestone B decision making is a good place to look, but that uh, we have to go back to as early as we can in this to the requirements uh, process and, and take a good look at the way that's done in a way I don't think the present legislation is quite touched yet. I, I appreciate that constructive criticism. I noticed that um, Mr. Francis uh, on page five of his testimony makes reference to a September 2008 GAO report where they reviewed JSID's documentation for new capability proposals, found that most were sponsored by the military services with little involvement from the joint community including the combatant commanders. Now, would everyone on the panel agree that that's a bad thing, that the lack of jointness and lack of involvement from the combatant co commanders is a profound negative in the process? Anybody disagree with that? Okay. And then um, Mr. Berteau, uh, in his testimony, I think correctly says, acquisition reform cannot happen without requirements reform and urges us to uh, engage in some flexibility for trade-off against cost and schedule. And I think what I heard this morning across the, the panel was that um, this is ultimately about, and I like this formulation of real requirements versus aspirational ones or um, optimal, perfect performance versus sufficient performance. I, I hear what you're saying. If we were going to develop a way of understanding the difference between, you know, the perfect performance in some metaphysical way and a robust, strong, terrific performance in a way that's more practical, whom do you think should help us draw that line? If we were to delegate that responsibility, looking at the services, at the joint structure, at the OSD, who's best positioned? to define carefully for us in a way that absolutely protects the lives of the people in uniform as the first uh, priority. Who would be the best person to draw that line? Or the best organization to draw that line? Mr. Dubrow? So I would start with the, the chiefs, the service chiefs. And right now the service chiefs don't formally sit on the requirements board. Mm -hmm. Vice chiefs do. And so yet you ask the service chief to be accountable for personnel and readiness and uh, all of the other issues of organizing, training, and equipping. So I think a role for the chiefs uh, on validating those, those requirements, and then you've got to force the chiefs to interact and to have the same jointness on requirements that they have in, in the battlefield on operations. Thank you. Because I only have a minute, I just ask if the others, they could very briefly answer that question, get on the record. Dr. Chu? Uh, sir, I think ultimately that's what you must hold the Secretary of Defense responsible for. And so ultimately it's the Secretary's office that must support him or her in that deliberation. Yes, the Chiefs have a role, but they are, in a sense, stakeholders in the process. They have a vision for their service. You emphasize jointness. That's a key aspect here. What is going to be the common position? Of the is it possible to have a common position? Right. So I think it's ultimately the Secretary in his office that you have to hold responsible for Mr. this Mr. Bertel? I, I agree with Dr. Chu. I think this ultimately lies at the feet of the Deputy Secretary of Defense, and he's got to take the chiefs and the military considerations into account, but I think it's the Deputy Secretary who's got to make the call. Thank, thank you, Mr. Francis. What do you think? Uh, Abri, um, uh, we believe that the, uh, the Deputy in his current role, uh, dual role as uh, Chief Management Officer, should be making that kind of uh, a decision, and I think the JROC does have to get bolstered by help, I think, from program analysis and evaluation and ddr &E to do the analytics. I thank, I thank the chairman for his indulgence. The one comment we'd be interested in supplementing on the record is if we establish that dichotomy of, you know, real requirements versus whatever we want to call them, uh, would that then lead to a different set of decision-making dynamics? Uh, what, what's uh, non-negotiable, what's negotiable? I, I, I don't have time to ask you for an oral answer to that, but I'd be very interested in thinking about what consequences would flow from that change in definition and requirement process. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, uh, Mr. Klein. Uh, the 
there is just one 15 minute vote as opposed to what the uh, uh, bells rang a few moments ago. But uh, we'll proceed for a short while, get the one vote and come right back. Mr. Klein. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, gentlemen, for your uh, years of service and your testimony today. Uh, I've been scratching my head like most of you over this, seems like all my life, and noticing that we've had Secretary's Defense and Deputy Secretary's Defense and USDA's and USDA TNOs and PA and E's and DDR and E's and on and on and on in an endless stream uh, trying to trying to solve this problem. And so, you know, Mr. Berteau, I had great sympathy and empathy with your comments of, well, this is such a good idea, how come we haven't done it? Because clearly there have been great ideas after great ideas after great ideas. Uh, I have appreciated very much the discussion this morning about the requirements process. And it always has seemed clear to me that it's been badly broken for a very, very long period of time. A lot of discussion here today about requirements creep or overreaching or looking at the stars to put a requirement in. And Dr. Chu, I appreciated your, you know, what's the requirement? It's the box has got to fit in the airplane. Um, presumably the airplane has to fly and you've got to be able to, so, but, so there, is a, there is a level there for requirement, but, but clearly if it doesn't do more than what we have, there, there's no point, right? We'll just make some more uh, M151 Jeeps instead of Humvees or something. Um, and so anything, it seems to me, anything we can do to fix that requirements uh, process is going to be time very, very well spent. I, I happen to think there are lots of other problems still existing in, in the acquisition from developmental testing, operational testing, organizations itself in the services and in OSD. And this uh, bill that um, Mr. Andrews and Mr. Conaway and others put together uh, with, the, uh, with the guidance of the chairman and the ranking member uh, gets at this early end, and that seems to me to be a pretty good thing. But we're going to make law here. We're going to we're going to pass some legislation, and we're going to put some things out there. And so, I, my only question to you is: Does this do harm? Does this bill do harm? And may, maybe it's marginally better, maybe it's a lot better. But is there something in this legislation that you looked at and said, "We better not do this"? And and if so, this is this will be your chance to say so. Anybody, it's open to anybody who looked at something in this bill and said, that's not a good idea, this will hurt. If I may, sir, I, I'm, I'm less concerned with provisions of the House bill than some provisions of the Senate bill. And, and uh, two specifically would uh, concern me. One is splitting the cost function out from the larger analytic enterprise. I think it will diminish its excellence over time by that uh, move. That's a specific. More generally, uh, and this is, I think, supportive of the House uh, version, uh, more generally, I think Congress, uh, in my estimation, wisely has left the specifics of the organization, the Secretary of Defense, to the Secretary. It needs to be tailored to his or her needs, to the needs of that era, to his or her decision-making style, et cetera. So be very careful about hard wiring, which I don't believe that, to my reading, I'm not a lawyer, but to my reading, the House bill does not do. I knew there was something about you I really liked, Dr. Chu. <laughs> <laughs> my apologies to the others. Uh, but I'd be very careful about hardwiring the Secretary's office in statute. It will not necessarily produce the results that you desire. And, and you don't think that this bill does that, so you don't but see I harm read the there House unless bill, we No, you, okay. you ask, if I understand the House right. bill correctly, that there be an official designated for this responsibility. So you call out certain capacities you want to see in the Secretary's office, but you leave it, as I read the legislative language to the secretary side, how is he or she going to achieve that, achieve that end? Okay. Anybody else see, is there, is there harm in this thing? In the do no harm, you know, there may be some physicians in the room. Mr. Klein, I think uh, uh, as written, I don't see harm. As it gets implemented, there's potential for harm that I think that, that you want to watch out for. I think one is what you do with the role of the cost analysis improvement group uh, as part of the larger uh, organization for cost estimating. I think uh, care would be, uh, you'd need to take care to keep the, the integrity of that organization and not have its, um, I think, its expertise lost in a larger organization. Um, 
and so I think that can be protected. Uh, I think how the, uh, the principal assistants are uh, charged with their responsibilities, I think uh, that'll be important because some out, somewhere out there there's a line between uh, making people, uh, say, champions for functions so these functions don't get traded away like they do today. But at some point, if that becomes too powerful, then I don't know wh where the Under Secretary of Defense for Acquisition, where his responsibilities say end and then no one is, is accountable. So there's a line out there. And uh, I think the, the third thing is the, um, the pre-milestone B thresholds for cost and schedule. I think that's a good thing that when a program, let's say, has a 25% increase before milestone B, you want to know that so you can make trades. But by the same token, you don't want that threat of a threshold to suppress programs from actually admitting they do have a cost increase because that could happen. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman. I see my time is out. I yield back. Thank you very much. We'll uh, recess very briefly for the vote and return immediately.